wanted to thank everyone very much for coming to this Locust Roundtable. Um, welcome you to the space. If you haven't been here already, if um, you're not on our mailing list, please feel free to join it. There's a sign-in sheet in the front. Um, I'm very pleased to, um, to announce Natalia Sulawaga um, and Stephanie Sherman, who are, is visiting us in Miami. Um, and they're about to do a reading of a science fiction story called The Appearance of Life. And so the way that this evening will carry on is that we will, um, Stephanie and Natalia will carry on this reading um, of the short story. And then um, we will open it up to an open discussion, um, which they will conduct. Um, and so um, we also have copies, which we are sharing. Please feel free to read along. And here we go. Thank you. I just wanted to first tell everybody why I picked this really weird story um, to share with you guys. I think when I read the press release for this particular ex exhibit that you had and this idea of putting images together that weren't random but that you know, you kind of found these multiple relationships, this idea of being this able... Carl Handel is yes. in the space right now, which is... Um, uh, 10,000 um, 35 millimeter black and white slides that are in all these various slide projectors, and they they project. Yeah, we'll turn the show on at the end. But if you haven't seen it, it's these images that that um, I would love them come together. So that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so the first thing really that came to mind was this really nice story about it was a science fiction story about the appearance of life, which had to do in a sense about these projected holograms, this love story that's in between somewhere. But it was very much apparent about images and about the way we archive things, and it was an initial thought. And then when I started to discuss this idea with Stephanie, and really about what we could bring to a table about discussing things, we really wanted to do an exercise about listening. And so we wanted to use the platform of a round table, in a sense, to do an exercise about listening, um, reading something that was kind of, a, of about seeing. And that's pretty much how this all came about. Um, Stephanie will kind of instruct us on how we're going to do this. Yeah, so I'm really excited to read this story with all of you. Um, so the idea is based on um, a, a teacher I had in second grade who used to lead us regularly on spirit readings. And the idea is that um, to keep everybody active and engaged in the story, um, I'll be your spirit guide and read a little bit and get us started. And then spirit reading works that you start and stop when the spirit moves you. Um, so it's as simple as when you feel done at the end of a paragraph or a little section, you can stop and someone else will pick up naturally and keep reading. It's really of the moment and very simple. So the idea is that we'll just read this story together as a group and then at the end of it, talk about the future of the museum, which is really what this story is about. Um, and so I invite you to like clear your throat and maybe grab a drink if you wanna. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no judgment, there's some crazy science fiction words in here yes. that we're all figuring out. I don't think they've ever been pronounced um, many times outside of this room. So um, yeah, so I'll kick us off, but please just join in. Um, so. The Appearance of Life. Something very large, something very small, a galactic museum, a dead love affair. They came together under my gaze. The museum is very large, less than a thousand light years from Earth, countless worlds bear constructions which are formidably ancient and inscrutable in purpose. The museum on Norma is such a construction. We supposed that the museum was created by a species which once lorded it over the galaxy, the Corla Valua. The specter of the Corla Valua has become part of the consciousness of the human race as it spreads from star system to star system. Sometimes the Corla Valua are pictured as demons hiding somewhere in a dark nebula, awaiting the moment when they swoop down on mankind and wipe every last one of us out in reprisal for having dared to invade their territory. Sometimes the Pearl of Valula are pictured as gods, riding with the awfulness and loneliness of gods through the deserts of space, potent and wise beyond our imagining. These two opposed images of the Pearl of Valula are of course images emerging from the deepest pools of the human mind. The demon and the god remain with us still. But there were the Pearl of Valula 
and there are facts we know about them. We know that they abandoned the written word by the time they reached their galactic building phase. Their very name comes down to us from the simple example of their alphabet we have, a sign emblazoned across the facade of a construction on La Caja. We know that they were inhuman. Not only does the scale of the constructions imply as much, they built always on planets inimical to man. What we do not know is what, we, what became of the Corlebev we love. They must have reigned so long, they must have been so invincible to all but time. Where knowledge cannot go, imagination ventures. Men have supposed that the Korla committed some kind of racial suicide, or that they became a race divided and totally annihilated themselves in a region of space beyond our galaxy, beyond the reach of mankind's starships. And there are more metaphysical speculations concerning the fate of the Korla Moved by the evolutionary necessity, they may have grown beyond the organic, in which case it may be that they still inhabit their ancient constructions undetected by man. There is a stranger theory which places emphasis on man, ident on mind identifiable with cosmos, and supposes that once a species begins to place credence in the idea of occupying the galaxy, then so it is bound to do. This is what mankind has done virtually imagining its illustrious predecessors out of existence. <coughs> well, there are many theories that I intended, but I, but I was intending to talk about the Museum of Norma. Like everything else, Norma possesses its riddles. The museum demarcates Norma's equator. The construction takes the form of a colossal belt grinding the planet some 16,000 kilometers in length. The belt varies curiously in, in thickness from 12 kilometers to over 22. The, the chief riddle about Norma is this. It is topographical computation, what is always was, or its peculiar, peculiarities due to the meddling of the, I'll call it the Corleys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Saved us. <laughs> for the construction, nearly divides the planet into a northern land uh, hemisphere and a southern oceanic hemisphere. On the one side lies an endless, his, in, endless territory of catering plain, scoured by winds and bluish snow. On the other side rises a formidable ocean of um, um, ammonia, uh, unbroken by islands inhabited by uh, firefish and other mysterious denizens. On the wildest section of the Cor Le Bao Lao. <laughs> what is that? Corleys. The Corleys. The, the Corleys. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? To Corleys. We shortened it. We shortened it. Right. Right. <laughs> On one of the wildest sections of, of the Corleys construction stands an incongruous huddle of buildings. Coming in from space, you are glad to see the huddle. Your ship takes you down. You catch your elevator. You emerge on the roof of the construction itself. And you rejoice in that. In the midst of the inscrutable symmetrical universe of which the Corleys formed not a not inconsiderable part, mankind has established an untidy foothold. For a moment, I paused by the ship, taking in the immensity about me. A purple sun was rising amid a cloud, making shadows race across the infinite seeming plan, plane on which I stood. The distance seemed hounded and moaned, lost, in my vision, lost to my vision. It was a solitary spot, but I was accustomed to solitude. On the planet I called home, I hardly met with another human from one year's end to the next, except on my visits to the breeding center. <laughs> the human four buildings on Norma enormous stand over one of the enormous entrances of the museum. They consist of a hotel for visitors, various office blocks, cargo handling equipment, and gigantic transmitters. The walls of the museum are impervious to the electromagnetic spectrum, so that any information from inside the construction comes by cable through the entrance and is then transmitted by second space to other parts of the galaxy. Seeker, you are expected. Welcome to the Norma Museum. So said the android who showed me into the airlock and guided me through the hotel. Here, as elsewhere, androids occupied all menial posts. I glanced at the calendar clock in the foyer, punching my wrist, my 
wrist tutor. <laughs> 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 my wrist tutor. <laughs> we were all arriving travelers to discover where in time Earth might be now. Gently sedated by alpha music, I slept away in my light lag and descended <laughs> next day to the museum itself. The museum was run by 20 human staff, all female. The director gave me all the information that a seeker might need, helped me to select a viewing vehicle, and left me to move on into the museum on my own. <coughs> Although we had many ways of growing unimolecular metals, the corolivalular construction on Norma was of an incomprehensible material. It had no joint or seam in its entire length. More, it somehow imprisoned or emanated light so that no artificial light was needed within. Beyond that, it was empty. The entire place was equatorially empty. Only mankind, taking it over a thousand years before, had turned it into a museum and started to fill it with galactic lumber. As I moved forward in my vehicle, I was not overcome by the idea of infinity as I had expected. The tendency towards infinity has presumably dwelt in the minds of mankind ever since our early ancestors counted up to 10 on their fingers. The habitation of the void has increased that tendency. The happiness which we experience as a species is of recent origin, achieved since our maturity. It also contributes to the disposition of, to a disposition to neglect any worries in the present in order to concentrate on distant goals. But I believe, this is a personal opinion, that the same tendency towards infinity in all its forms has militated against close relationships between individuals. We do not even love as our planet-bound ancestors did. We live apart as they did not. In the summer, quality of the light mitigated any intimations of infinity. I knew I was in an immense enclosed space, but since the light absolved me from any sensations of claustrophobia, <laughs> I will not attempt to describe that vastness. Over the previous 10 centuries, several thousand hectares had been occupied with human accretions. Androids were perpetually arranging exhibits. The exhibits were scanned by electronic means so that anyone on any civilized planet dis dialing, dialing, dialing <laughs> the museum might obtain by second space a three-dimensional image of the required object in his room. I traveled almost at random through the display. To qualify as a seeker, it was necessary to show a high serendipity factor. In my experimental behavior pool as a child, I had exhibited such a factor and had been selected for special training forthwith. I had taken additional courses in philosophical alpha humorals, incidental tetracotony, and <laughs> synchronicity, homo onto homo onto Genesis and other subjects, ultimately qualifying as a prime esemplastic seeker. In other words, I put two and two together in situations when other people were not thinking about addition. I connected. I made holes, holes greater than parts. Mine was an invaluable profession in a cosmos increasingly full of parts. I had come to the museum with a sheaf of assignments from numerous institutions, universities, and individuals all over the galaxy. Every assignment required my spatial talent, the capacity beyond holography. Let me give one example. The Audile Academy of the University of Padden on the planet Rufado was working on a hypothesis that over the millennia, human voices were gradually generating fewer fonts, or in other words, becoming quieter. Any evidence I could collect in the museum concerning this hypothesis would be welcome. The academy, the, the academy could scan the whole museum by remote holography, yet only a rare physical vis visitor like me was a gestalt view of the contents possible, and only to a seeker would a significant juxtapositioning be noted. My heart took me slowly through the exhibits. There were nourishment machines at intervals throughout the museum, so that I did not need to leave the establishment. I slept 
in my vehicle. It was comfortably provided with funds. On the second day, I spoke idly to a nearby ant clerk before beginning my morning drive. Do you enjoy ordering the exhibits here? I could never tire of it. She smiled pleasantly at me. You find it interesting? It's endlessly interesting. The quest for pattern is a basic instinct. Do you always work in this section? No, but this is one of my favorite sections. As you have probably observed, here we classify extinct diseases or diseases which would be extinct if they were not preserved in the museum. I find the microorganism beautiful. You are kept busy? Certainly. Your exhibits arrive every month, from the largest to the smallest. Everything can be stored here. May I show you anything? Not at present. How long before the entire museum is filled? In 15 and a half millennia, at current rate of intake. Have you went to the empty part of the museum? I have stood on the fringes of emptiness. It is an alarming sensation. I prefer to occupy by myself with the work of the museum.
at my shoulder was a museum eye. Activating it, I requested the official catalog to describe the object I held. The reply was immediate. You are holding a ring which slipped onto the finger of a human being when our species was of smaller stature than today, said the catalog. Like the spaceship, the ring dates from the first galactic era, but it is thought to be somewhat older than the ship. The dating tallies with what we know of the function, largely symbolic of the ring. It was worn to indicate married status it was worn to indicate married status in a woman or man. This particular ring may have been an hereditary possession. In those days, marriages were expected to last until progeny were born, or even until death. The human biomass was then divided 50-50 between males and females, <clears throat> excuse me, in dramatic contrast to the 10 to 1 uh, females in our stellar societies. Hence, the idea of coupling for life was not so illogical as it sounds. However, the ring itself must be regarded as a harmless illogic, designed merely to express a bondage or linkage. I broke the connection. A wedding ring. It represented symbolic communication. At such, it would be of value to a professor studying the metamorphosis of nonverbality who was employing my services. A wedding ring. A closed circuit of love and thought. I wondered if this particular marriage had ended for both the partners on the ship. The items preserved did not answer my question, but I found a flat photograph encased in plastic windows of a man and a woman together in outdoor surroundings. They smiled at the apparatus recording them. Their eyes were flat, betokening their undeveloped cranial reserves, yet they were not attractive. I observed that they stood closer together than we would normally care to do. Could that be something to do with the limitations of the apparatus photographing them? Or had there been a change in the social convention of closeness? Was there a connection here with the decibel output of the human voice, which might interest my clients in the auto economy? Possibly our auditory equipment was more subtle than that of our ancestors when they were confined to one planet under heavy atmospheric pressure. I filed the details away for future reference. A fellow seeker had told me jokingly that the secret of the universe was locked away in the museum if only I could find it. We'll stand a better chance of that when the museum is complete, I told her. No, she said. The secret will then be too deeply buried. We shall merely have transferred the outside universe to the inside of the Corky's construction. You'd better find it now or never. The idea that there may be a secret or key to the universe is in any case a construct of the human mind or of the mind that built the human mind, she said. That night I slept in the section of early galactic travel and continued my researches there on the sixth day. I felt a curious excitement over and above Nasthadani and simply of antiquarian interest. My senses were alert. I drove among 20 great ships belonging to the second galactic era, the longest was over five kilometers in length and had housed many scores of women and men in its day. This had been the epoch when our kind had attempted to establish empires in space and extend primitive national or territorial obsessions across many light years. The facts of relativity had doomed such efforts from the start. Under the immensities of space-time, they were put away as childish things. It was no paradox to say that among interstellar distances, mankind had become more at home with itself. Although I, although I did not, although, me, although I did not enter the behemoths, I remained amongst them, sampling the brutal way in which militaristic technologies express themselves in metal. Such successes would ever recur. Beyond the behemoths, androids were arranging fresh exhibits. Exhibits slid along, slid along in, in transporters far overhead, conveying silently from the museum entrance to the to the lord where, and lord were needed, drawing closer to where the new arrivals were being uploaded, were being unloaded. I passed among an array of shelves. On the shelves lay items retrieved from colonial homes or ships of the quasi-imperial days. I marveled at the collection. As people had proliferated, so had objects. A concern, 
A concern with possession had been a priority during the immaturity of the species. These long dead people had seemingly thought of little else but possession in one form or another, yet like androids in similar circumstances, they could not have recognized the limitations of their own I'm welt. I'm white. <laughs> Among the muddle, a fearless cube caught my eye. Its sides are smooth and silver. <laughs> I picked it up and turned it over. On one side was a small depression. I touched the depression slowly with my finger. Slowly, the size of the cube clarified, and a young woman's head appeared three-dimensionally inside them. The head was upside down. The eyes regarded me. You are not Chris Mailer, she said. I talk only to my husband. Switch off and set me right, up, right, up, right way up. Your husband died 65,000 years ago, I said. But I set her cube down on the shelf, not unmoved by being addressed by an image from the remote past. That, that it possessed environmental reflection made it all the more impressive. I asked the museum catalog about the item. In the jargon of the time, it is a holocap, said the catalog. It's a hologrammed image of a real woman with a facsimile of her brain implanted on a collapsed germanium alloy core. core. <laughs> it generates an appearance of life. Do you require the technical specification? Specifics? Specifics? <laughs> no, I want its provenance. It was taken from a small armed spaceship, a scout, built in the 201st year of the Second Era. The scout was partially destroyed by a bomb from the planet Skundra, and the board were killed, but the ship went into orbit about Skundra. Do you require details of the engagement? No. Do we want to know who the woman is? These cells are recent acquisitions, and have only just been cataloged. Other Skundra acquisitions are still arriving. We may find more data at a later date. The cube itself had not been properly examined. It was sensi sensitized to the respond only to the cerebral emissions of the woman's husband. Such holocaps were popular with the second era women and men on stellar flights. They provided life-mimicking mementos of partners elsewhere in the cosmos. For further details, you may. That's sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> Now, all precautions have been taken. The catalog 
Roosevelt's brief history plunged me into meditation. I thought about the Skundra incident, now so unimportant. The wiping out of a whole world full of people, evidence again of that lust for possession which had by now relinquished its grip on the human soul. Or was the museum itself an indication that traces of the lust remained, now intellectualized into a wish to possess, not merely objects, but the entire past of mankind, and, indeed, what my friend had jokingly referred to as the secret of the universe. I told myself then that cause and effect operated only arbitrarily on the level of the psyche, that lust to possess could itself create a secret to be found, as a hunt provides its own quarry. And if once found, then the whole complex of human affairs might be unraveled beneath the spell of one gigantic simplification, until motivation was so lowered that life would lose its purport, whereupon our species would wither and die, all tasks fulfilled. Such, indeed, could have happened to the unassailable Corla Valua. To what, <laughs> to what extent the, inner, the inorganic and the organic universe where unity could not be determined until ultimate heat death brought parity? But, the, but it was feasible to suppose that each existed for the other, albeit higher organically. Organic systems with intelligence might achieve unity, union with the encompassing universe through knowledge, through the possession of that secret of which my friend joked. That union would represent a peak, a flowering. Beyond it lay only decline a metaphysical correspondence to the second law of thermodynamics. Breaking from this chain of reasoning, I realized two things immediately. Firstly, that I was well into my serendipitous seeker phase, and secondly, that I was about to take from an android's hand an item he was unloading from the carrier platform. As I unwrapped it from its translucent covering, the catalog said, the object you hold was retrieved from the capital city of Skundra. It was found in the apartment of a married couple named Jean and Lan Gopal. Other objects are arriving from the same source. Do not misplace it or our assistants will be confused. It was a holocaust, like the one I had examined the day before, perhaps because it was a more sophisticated example. The, ca the casing was better, turned, the buttons so well concealed that I found it almost by accident. Moreover, the cube lit immediately, and the illusion that I was holding a man's head in my hand was strong. The man looked about, caught my eye, and said, This holocap is intended only for my ex-wife, Jean Gopal. I have no business with you. Switch off and be good enough to return me to Jean. This is Chris Mailer. The image died. I held only a cube in my hands. In my mind, questions flowered 65,000 years ago. I pressed the switch again. Eyeing me straight, he said in unchanged tones, This holocap is intended only for my ex-wife, Jean Gopal. I have no business with you. Switch off and be good enough to return me to Jean. This is Chris Mailer. Certainly, it was all that was left of Chris Mailer. His face made a powerful impression. His features were generous, with high forehead, long nose, powerful chin. His gray eyes were wide set, his mouth ample but firm. He had a neat beard, brown and streaked with gray. About the temples, his hair also carried streaks of gray. His face was unlined and generally alert, although not without melancholy. I resurrected him up from the electronic distances and made him go through his piece again. Now I shall unite you with your ex-wife, I said, as I loaded the holocap into my vehicle and headed back towards the cache of the day before, I knew that my train talent was with me, leading me. There was a coincidence and a contradiction here, or seemed to be, for both coincidences and contradictions are more apparent than real. It was no very strange thing that I should come upon the woman's holocap one day and the man's the next. Both were being unloaded from the same planetary area, brought to the museum in the same operation. The contradiction was more interesting. The woman had said that she spoke only to her husband. The man, he spoke only to his ex-wife. Was there a second woman involved? 
before the chief and seemed young, whereas the man that they were was past the flush of youth. The woman had been on the planet Scundra, whereas Mailer had been on the scout ship. They had been on opposing sides in that war, which ended in death for all. How the situation had arisen appeared inexplicable after 650 centuries. Yet as long as there remained power in this molecular structure of hollow capsules, the chance existed that this insignificant fragment of the past could be reconstructed. Not that I knew whether two holocausts could converse together. I stood the two cubes on the same shelf, a meter apart, and switched them on. The images of two heads were reborn. They looked about them as if alive. Mailer spoke first, staring intensely across the shelf at the female head. Jean, my darling, it's Chris, speaking to you after all this long time. I hardly know whether I ought to, but I must. Do you recognize me? Although Jean's image was of a woman considerably younger than his, it was less brilliant, more grainy, captured by an inferior piece of holocrafty. Oh, holocrafty. 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 Chris, I'm my wife, your little Jean. This is for you wherever you are. I know we have our troubles, but I was never able to say this when we were together. Chris, but I do love our marriage. It means a lot to me, and I want it to go on. I send you love wherever you are. I think about you a lot. You said, well, you know what you said, but I hope you still care. I want you to care, because I do care for you. It's over a dozen years since we've parted, my darling Jean I know I broke up the marriage of me, but I was younger than you, and foolish, even at the time. A part of me warned, okay? warned that I was making a mistake. I pretended that I knew you, didn't care for you. You cared all the time, didn't you? Not only do I care, but I will try to show more of my inner feelings in the future. Perhaps I understand you better than you. I know I've not been as responsive as I might be in several ways. Stood fascinating and baffled by this dialogue, which carried all sorts of overtones beyond my comprehension. I was listening to the conversations of primitive beings. The image of her face had my best. Indeed, a part of the flat eyes and an excess of the hair she passed for pretty, the voluptuous mouth and wide eyes, which I think she took it for granted that she might have a man for her own possession, while he acted under similar assumptions. Whereas the mailer's mode of speech was slow and thoughtful, but without hesitation, Jean talked fast, moving her head about, hesitating and interrupting herself as she spoke. He said, you don't know what it's like to live with regret. At least, I hope you don't, my dear. You never understood regret in all its ramifications as I do. I remember I called you superficial once, just before we broke up. That was because you were content to live in the present. The past or the future meant nothing to you. It was something I could not comprehend at the time, simply because for me, the past and future are always with me. You never made reference to things past, whether happy or sad, and I couldn't stand that. Fancy, I let such little matter come between our love. There was your affair with Gopal, too. That hurt me, and forgive me. That fact, that fact that he was black added salt to my wound, but even there I should have taken more of the blame. I was arrogant then, and I am now, Jean. I'm not much good at going over this one thing, as you know, so. I live each day as it comes. But the entanglement with Lan Gopal, well, I admit I was, attracted to, I was attracted to him. You know he went for me, and I couldn't resist. Not that I'm exactly blaming Lan. He was very sweet. But I want you to know that that's all over now, really over. I'm happy again. We belong to each other. I still feel what I, what I always did, Jean. You must have been married to Gopal for ten years now. Perhaps you've forgotten me. Perhaps this hollow cap won't be welcome. As I stood there compelled to listen, the two images stared rapidly at each other, conversing without communicating. We think differently, in different ways. I mean, Jean said, glancing downwards, you can explain better. You are always the intellectual. I know you despise me because I'm not clever, don't you? You used to say we had nonverbal communication. I don't quite know what to say, except that I was sad to see you leave on another trip, going off hurt and angry, and I wished, oh well, as you see, your, your poor wife 
is trying to make up for her deficiencies by sending you this helicat. It comes with love, dear Chris, hoping, oh everything, that you'll come back to, here to me on Earth and that things will be as they used to be between us. We do belong to each other and I haven't forgotten. During this speech, she became increasingly agitated. I, don't, I know you don't want me back, Jean, Miller said. Nobody can turn back time, but I had to get in touch with you when the chance came. You gave me a helicat 15 years ago and I've had it with me on my travels ever since. When our divorce came through, I joined a fleet of space mercenaries. Now we're fighting for the pan slobs. I've just learned that we're coming to Skundra, although not with the best of motives. So I'm having this holocap made, trusting there'll be a chance to deliver it to you. The message is simple, is simple really. I forgive anything you may think there is to forgive. After all these years, you still mean a lot to me, Jean, though I'm less than nothing to you. Chris, I'm your wife. Chris, I'm your wife. You're a little genius. I'll throw you wherever you are. I know you are in your troubles, but I was never able to say when we were together. Chris, but I do live our marriage. It's, it means a lot to me, and I want to want it to go on. <laughs> it's a strange thing, but it comes as an enemy to what is to what is uh, no. to what is now. I suppose your home planet since you married Gospel Gospel. I always knew that. Always knew that bastard was no good. <laughs> warming, more, warming his way in between us. Tell him I hear. Tell him I bear him no uh, malice so long as he's taken care of me. Whatever else he has. She said, I send you love wherever you are. I think about you a lot. I hope he's made you forget all about me. He owes me that. You and I were once all in all to each other, and life's never been this happy for me again, whatever I pretend to others. He said, well, you know what he said, but I hope you still care. I want you to care, because I do care for you. Not only do I care, but I will try to show more of my inner feelings in the future. Perhaps I understand you better now. Jean, my darling, it's Chris, speaking to you after all this long time. I hardly know whether I ought to, but I must. I turned away. At least I understood. Only on the incomprehensible things of which the images spoke had canceled the truth for me for so long. The images could converse, triggered by pauses in each other's monologues but what they had to say had been programmed before they met. Each had a role to play and was unable to transcend it by a hair breadth. No matter what the other image might say, they could not reach beyond what was predetermined. The female, with less to say than the male, had run out of talk first and simply begun her chatter over again. Jean's holocap had been made some 15 years before Mailer's. She was talking from a time when they were still, when they were still married, he from a time some years after their divorce. Their images spoke completely at odds. There had never been a dialogue between them. These trivial resolutions passed through my mind and were gone. Greater things occupied me. Second era man had passed with all his bustling possessive affairs. The godly Kor Levavula had too passed away, or so we thought. We were surrounded by their creations, but of the Kor Levavula themselves there was not a sign. We could come no more to see a sign. We could no more see a sign of them than Jean and Mailer could see a sign of me, although they had responded in their own way. My function as a prime and plastic seeker was more than fulfilled. I had made an ultimate whole greater than the parts. I had found that my joking friend called the secret of the universe. Like the images I had observed, the galactic human race was merely a projection. The Korlababula Kor had created us, not as a genuine creation with free will, but as some so sort of a reproduction. There would never be proof of that, only intuition. I had learned to trust my intuition. As with those imprisoned images, the human species was gradually growing fainter, less able to hear the program responses. As with those imprisoned image, images, we were all drifting further apart, losing definition. As with those imprisoned images, we were doomed to root through the debris of the past because copies 
have no greater future. Here was my own gigantic simplification. Here my union with the encompassing universe. This was the flowering before the decline. No, my idea was nonsense. If it excuse me, my deductions were utterly unfounded. I knew there was no ultimate secret of the universe. And in any case, supposing humanity to be merely a construct of the Cordova, uh, who then constructed the Port of the Valley Wall. The prime question was merely set back one step. But for every level of existence, there's a key to a central enigma. Those keys enable life forms to ascend the scale of life or to reach an impasse to flourish or become extinct. I found a key which would cause many species to wither and die. Ours was merely a wealth, unwelt, not a universe. I left the museum. I flew my ship away to Norway. I did not head back to my home. <laughs> <laughs> I left the museum. I flew my ship away from Norma. I did not head back to my home world. I went instead to a desolate world on which I now intend to end my days communicating with no one. Let them assume that I caught a personal flight instead of detecting a universal one. If I communicate, the chance is that the dissolution I feel within me will spread and spread forever. <laughs> Such was my mental agony that only when I reached this uh -oh, barren. Barren. barren habitation, it was blurry, blurry habitation, uh, <laughs> did I recall what I neglected to do in the museum. I forgot to switch off the hollow caps. There they may remain, conducting their endless conversation until power dies. Only then will the two talking heads sink into blessed nothingness and be gone. Sound will fade, images will die. Silence remain. Yeah. Questions, comments? <laughs> it got spicy for a second. Stephanie and I were dreaming of edits to this, insertions. I mean, it was so weird. It touched on so many different subjects that we were like, it needs a steamy scene. It needs to like, really, just to make that love part that lasts like two pages too long. <laughs> Even more interesting. The museum um, didn't have anything we could describe as art. It just had no. relics, relics and memories. It's kind of like yeah. the what first thing I thought. I didn't quite get what I'm well a mult is like the limitation of your like of your consciousness. So like your particular our universe, how we understand it is our um well. So it was like more, the, the place was more like a natural history museum. Yeah. It was a natural universal history museum. Yeah, the idea was that they were going to collect basically the history of the entire galaxy inside of the this equator. Right, right. It was big enough to house it. Yeah. It's kind of Borgesian in that sense. It's like you build a space that's big enough to fill the space that's big enough. <laughs> Yeah, it's in close the so universe. Mm -hmm. Not a universe, but a galaxy. Wait, can you guys galaxy. place this in, like, scope? Again, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand it. It's the scope the of? Scope, the scope of this story. This, what part? What do you mean? Like, as you like, the universe, like, is it beyond the universe? Is it the galaxy? Oh. Oh, like the planet is universe? just a few light years away. They discovered this planet that has a, a structure that was built by the Corkies um, <laughs> and on the equator, or they assume it was built by the Corkies that splits this planet from a northern hemisphere to a, a southern hemisphere. And humans have taken over this space in order to build a museum that houses the history of the galaxy. The relics of the history of the galaxy. Exactly. And so they have all of the ships from like space travel and earth and all of the diseases and everything and they're bringing and collecting and cataloging things and this idea of the unwell that you know she talks about or she talks about the seeker talks about is interesting because she first kind of deals with it with the androids you know humans creating these robots with a particular limitation and a purpose you know a, and they find it incredibly fantastic because they think it's limitless and so this disappointment of her finding that in fact our own creativity our own limitations are not limitless that we are not kind of these beings of free will but within the constraints of the that created us 
is kind of like you know the secret of the universe. That's a big brew at the end. We're discovering our own limitations. Mm -hmm. Right. And the holocaps can only talk to each other as much yeah. as they're programmed. And the holocaps can only talk to each other. I what think are the holocaps like? What is the allegory to what they are in today's world? Or is there one? Does it work? A phone message? Like yeah. Head, the communications head. Talking head would be like a political pundit. You know? Like in Star Wars, which you know, Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah. You're my only hope. <laughs> but they can they can somewhat talk, but only so far. They kind of give you the impression that they can talk, and so when you put them in front of each other the first time, they repeat each other, but be, you know they, they are almost in discussion. But what because her dialogue is shorter, she goes into a loop mm -hmm. much faster, and so and their conversation, though. yeah, sure. kind of falls apart. Seems like he discovered that though towards the end, the protagonist eventually yeah. realized this isn't an actual conversation. Exactly. They're like, oh, wait a minute, wait. these are two form yeah. messages. Please, I'm sorry. What did you say? In other words, when you're reading it, you don't realize that right away. You know, you actually think they're in a conversation, and then you realize that because they're not sequenced in the same amount of time that they're pre-programmed. It's a but loop. It, it's a loop, but you don't know that right away. You discover that as you're reading, or your, right. you know, the protagonist discovers that himself. And it's kind so. of as if you know, it, um, men and women are programmed to not understand one another, are programmed to speak at different. There was a gen no gendered. Uh, Thing that arose. Yeah. Certainly. Certainly, yeah. Which I, I was not expecting in this piece. Really? No, there's a couple of things in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Dated. Yeah. it's like totally dated. The race card was the dropped. Race card was <laughs> dropped. Uh, when was the, was the date of publication? 1977. And he's British? And he's British. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really? I so found Oh, go ahead. I found the 65,000 yeah, year old marital <laughs> spat interesting. <laughs> what was that? What did it that it, that, it, that the, the, the marital like argument ended up lasting 65,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> that was just speaking to me today. Yeah. Uh -oh. And uh, it still it, rings true in today's time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how we think a museum is, can be so important, but um, you know, in the whole scope of things. Mm -hmm. It could even be recording like weird stuff that's not even going to be appreciated later. So it's like on the, the idea of what is it that trajectories. is collected and remembered in, a, in an institution of history or whatever a museum does. Well, that's kind of like what we have now in museums. Like we've got the Tupperware bowls of prehistory. Sure. Yeah. So it's like, how interesting is that? The idea of the bowl that we have in the future, they might be totally interesting. I like how they brought up the idea that they preserved even the viruses, the diseases, like, so they, like you, you might need them as a future to let them go, you know, to get rid of the problem. So it's, like, it's like preserving anthrax, preserving, which, which happens today. All these things are kept alive. For what? You gotta like wonder why. <laughs> So I'm thinking that I, you know, this was written in 1977. I found the parallel of the museum really interesting because of this like obsession with over archive, like archive mania that we kind of are, we go through. And so I, we were wondering like, this is, thir what is it, 35 years ago? If we could envision then like how far this could go and what a museum is of the future, and like that's a, that's kind of a question we wanted to pose to you guys, like. How far could a museum in the yeah, future Yeah, what is this? Go? Yeah, exactly. But this is envisioning a museum in the future, but it's kind of not far off from the museum of today. <laughs> we have different kinds of museums, right? We have natural history museums, mm -hmm. contemporary art museums, um, art museums from other periods, um, all kinds of different kinds of collections. The Wilsonian, collects of posters, propaganda. But also the way that things are collected and displayed are very interesting too. The museological approach has an anthropological bent. If you go to the University of Miami's uh, museum, the Native American stuff is sort of jumbled together as like this irrelevant stuff versus the European wall display of this painting, this painting. So it's very interesting how we they're saying stuff about saying stuff. It's just kind of looking. Saying stuff about saying stuff. Exactly. Ding, ding.
mission statement but almost like an imagine it like right. well, how would you construct right. it and, and all, all the way to the oppositional kind of stuff I think the, the museum of the future probably is just the momentary receptacle of things that are relevant to the, the present culture and somehow maybe they will be uh, open to trade open to uh, empty their storages for acquiring more works. And the works that are part of the museum probably they just travel and then they can even be returned back to their owners or just <laughs> thrown away because they're not relevant anymore. Um, since we're in a digital time, probably just by creating holograms, 3D kind of like a holograms just for the sake of going back to it in case of need. But having the physical object, I don't know if that's the goal of the museum or um, Probably it is more about just showing whatever at the moment and just let it move on. <laughs> I think that would be my idea of the when the, I mean, we're, we operate today in a, in a mode of institution, post-institutional critique, where museums and institutions are places that have been criticized publicly and have adopted this, have adopted its, their own criticism, and then they've moved on and made, like, as you say, instead of trying to, to put what's on the past and on a pedestal, it's about, let's figure out what's happening today and put it out there. We're not even saying if it's good or bad or what. So we operate today, especially in contemporary art, in this environment of post-institutional critique where we do not, uh, where, we, where institutions are critical of their holdings. But well, I mean, it's something to this question because, I mean, um, uh, if we're talking about art museums, that's one big issue. If we're talking about a science museum, which totally relates to human uh, and not even human at the, the planet by itself, I think is is totally relevant to uh, to acquire and, and preserve uh, stuff. I went, for instance, to the Science Museum in Berlin and the Natural History Museum, and basically the entire collection is being digitalized, and they make holograms um, for a very simple reason. Because they cannot keep on preserving stuff that is subject to die mm -hmm. and to decay and to move. So taking advantage of that, they literally make 3D models, they, they make yeah. holograms, and, and the experience probably is not the same. But anyways, who wants to look at a, a, a stuffed animal mm -hmm. in a museum that it or looks pathetic. Preserving, preserving the ideas, preserving the history in a way that's still accessible. Yeah, I mean, you. you yeah, it's so how long did you keep on having a memory of something that. I mean, for how long? It, it, it's like when you have a museum, you go there to understand, oh, this is what this group of people find is most important for the people of the future to see. So it's kind of interesting the story that at the end, they do have, you know, it's all technologically advanced. It's just like this connection 
between two people and they kind of just want to show that yeah but still the most important thing we feel is that it's love yeah so boom, yeah. that's what we want to present so i think the museum of the future would be a collective idea of what we feel the future should understand what we think is mostly important and it, it doesn't matter what time i feel it's still going to be like human connection I, I, I agree with it, but this is the this, this subject of judgment. And people uh, uh, working in this environment, they have a judgment. And they will select exactly what they consider is the best. So it's not a, it's not a collective uh, uh, decision for the well being of, uh, 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 of, of a totality. Because it was always. androids that were setting it up, they were the workers, they were the museum. So. So I, I kind of almost looked at this kind of, it's kind of fascinating because it almost, it predates the internet, it predates all that. So it's speaking of automatrons who, who take care of the, take, who take care of human, humanity's culture. Because androids know what is the best or the, or the highest or the more important stuff to take care of, to preserve. And what's, I, I, they also, they know that also that hint at when no one shows up because the, 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 uh, the, 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 the narrator was talking about, she, he, whoever would go to the, and there would be like no one there but the androids, which is kind of like in a sense, it's like it's getting to the point now where eventually we will be able to just go online because of 3D printing, you will be able to just download the image to yourself. And mm -hmm. So you will have no more, no more need anymore to even go to the museum. So the museum just going to end up being, Museum of the Future just may be a, a, this, this virtual, exist in virtual reality only and not be brick and mortar, it would just be files. So you, 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 if, you want to, if you want to see David, then you pretty much download the image with your 3D printer. <laughs> so then we can make it. Uh, yeah, well video, obviously you could already do that, but, but in terms of like solid objects, you know, the object where uh, the dispersion of objects could be eventually, you know, you know just be through 3D printing, you know, so you have but, your own. This is also a little bit, there's this moment in this where it's about, like, the museum is a place where messages go to get realized and then also to never, like, to be delivered and never delivered, mm -hmm. right? So, like, I think as artists, we're kind of in some ways dreaming of creating artifacts that are emblematic of our time or, artif or we make artifacts that kind of travel or carry beyond the timeliness of today. But then in this case, they're sort of, there's this realization, this moment where you're so happy that, oh, maybe they're finally communicating this, these messages were never realized in any other form, and now they're finally almost there, and yet there's, there's no result at all. And yet it does seem a little bit better than them having never played at all, maybe. Well, um, right. One of the things, I mean, I've recently been brainwashed by uh, historic <laughs> interpretation uh, for my job, and at any time you put a couple things together in a room, you've, you've interpreted, you've changed it, the viewer will never see it as, as it was seen, so any, any way you touch or set up um, an exhibit really affects the way people understand it, and in this, the, uh, the visitor was uh, constructing their own meaning from different sections, so there wasn't an interpretation, they were, they were, they were trying to make connections that maybe existed and maybe didn't exist. Right. Uh, so that's very different in the way we go to a, a museum. Things are set up by, by section, um, and in that scenario, it was just kind of randomly dumped, like you would uh, put something in a warehouse, but without order. The the randomness of that struck me. It's gonna be a good moment. But something we didn't maybe talk about the project for a sec. Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm one of the founders of a museum in North Carolina called Elsewhere. Um, many people in this room have been there, or a few of you. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a 58-year collection that one woman amassed. It's like all secondhand surplus and thrift, and she was a hoarder. We call her a horticulturalist. Um, <laughs> and uh, she left it all in piles to the ceiling after she passed away. It's a three-story building in downtown Greensboro, and her grandson and I, 10 years ago, started rearranging all of this. 
and nothing, selling nothing, and now we invite artists from all over the world to come and reinvent it and reinterpret it, and nothing's for sale, and nothing leaves, and it's just endlessly um, reconstructed. And, you know, sometimes we feel like we're finding the secrets of the universe that are contained in everyday household objects and appliances, <laughs> and sometimes we think we're absolutely crazy, because all we're doing is rearranging objects ad infinitum. Um, but <laughs> it really is about the p connections between the people that you experience more than the things themselves are really just platforms for what happens with the people there. I was actually going to say um, that after hearing like maybe the ideas of the Museum of the Future and the choreograms and the information and downloading, I did in my humble experience on museums, I think that it's like going to the movies. Is there a difference between watching a movie in your house at all or with a lot of people in the same room? There's an experience that's being shared that transforms what you're seeing into, into another level of maybe collective understanding of something. So in the same case, what you're saying is like in this situation, these toys that we all play that exist in this house, have a different impact on, on you when you approach it in a setup with 10 other people other than in your house, in your drawer, or downloading it from an image. I'm just saying like the individual approach to works, the collective approach, and maybe that's what a museum, I don't know, a characteristic from a museum, right? Like the community share, sharing. In a shared association right, like a shared. versus a... And also, I was also reading about public domain today a lot. And like, I wonder, for example, like for example, Shakespeare, all Shakespeare's works are in public domain. And so all those things also, like, where is now technology and their files, then how are they all in these like, museums of the future? Right. Files and holograms and, and share things and then load them. And how are they cared for? I mean, that's a, what museums and institutions do. They care for objects. Secure, curating historically is about caring and protecting objects. They also they provide the spectacle. Mm -hmm. You know, the, seeing a movie in a movie theater is a lot more spectacular than... Than seeing it in your house, but maybe that shows... Or reading a Shakespeare theater. play or watching a right. production. Watching a Shakespeare play versus downloading it from the internet and reading it. Yourself. And there's something to rescue about what you were saying is like the fact that it's about that. And it's like, okay, and so here they're preserving these holograms that don't even are communicating. But if there was something to get preserved, which is all they're talking about a ring and this and that, and at least the person who approached and interacted with these objects, however they were, understood the concept of love, maybe, or got you know, like experienced it in some different way, I don't know. But these beings in this story, they were disassociated from one another. That's the feeling that I get. Do you think that that's correct or not? Disassociated, yeah. yeah, they are. Disassociated yeah. from yeah. history, yeah. disassociated yeah. from one another. Well, they were just recordings. Right. Me, I think that's what's interesting about it, though, because just going back to what you said about your museum, I, what I love about it is there's a presentness. It's like a, the art, whoever's arranging it, it's their consciousness essentially articulating an assemblage. So it's an assemblage of object, objects in the way that I assemble them, the way you assemble them, the way you interact with them, and it's always going to be different. And that's very different from the notion of preservation, okay? Where you're coming from two different places. So what I get from the story is that um, the interaction, you know, vis-a-vis -vis love or relationships, um, that there's always a there's always a participatory notion, right, to 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 think about, and I think that there's an interesting s struggle between the kind of hubris of a notion of a museum or traditional museum, which deals with the preservation of value and the el the elevation, right, of those values, versus what you're doing. I've, no I've never heard that, and it. That's really incredible because it's the same objects. It's not like it's, you know, a new installation, right? Or it's something that changed. It's the same objects, the same catalog, but it's the consciousness of whoever's, you know, arranging it. So, and then of course the interaction of others within that, and that's a very different concept. And you can think of it. Around. Yeah. That's the best part. As a visitor, you're invited to. So we just also. I find that this particular experience that, and I've been there, and I've seen kind of what you've done there, and 
I find that the limitations or this kind of very dark secret of the universe that the seeker finds here about all images having this predetermined kind of limitation and meaning is kind of like what places like elsewhere attempt to, you know, like it's the same objects, right? And we can kind of, we know what their predetermined use was, but then you bring all of these different experiences to try to change and create these new combinations through collectivity and meanings and to draw meaning in different ways from pieces that, you know, have no relation to each other or to us or to even around us. And so I find that particular very, like, dark aspect of the, the limit of things. Well, that's a different, it, or maybe it's a, uh, it, there's a, it, it, this is about an agenda. This is about using these objects mm -hmm. that have already been collected and brought into this level of, um, of, of you know, heightened um, culture. Um, like, for example, like Fred Wilson, his Project Mining Museum, when he would go into historic museums, largely in the South, as a black artist working in contemporary art, and go in and find, okay, here we have a pair of slave shackles, here we have a pair, we have several busts of slaves that were made um, and, and typed um, and, and, and um, uh, you know, categorized as certain types of human. You know, like, it's very terribly wrong, um, racist approach. So he would bring, he would curate his exhibitions go into these archives of these objects that hadn't been seen in a hundred years and bring them to light so that he could forward an agenda. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, is this, I mean, do, do, does that happen in what you guys do or do you feel like that there's any, there's, are you interested I in that idea? All of, I mean, it's a response to like Duchamp and Fred Wilson mm -hmm. and all of these things, but I think more it's also asking the question of like what are the values inherent of singling things out and making them separate from anything else as opposed to just looking at everything we have in the world of, around us as abstracting the value of well and really recognizing that like all of these things together is beautiful and not only that but we have the power to rearrange it on the street like that we actually don't touch things in the way that we're actually granted as much access as we can. Do you feel like that's an insight into your curatorial practice or curatorial practice in general? Or sure. Or you know, like power to rearrange the way that things are? So Our that, answer right? is very heavy in documentation. Like before any object gets moved, most likely there's a picture on the way it was before and after. But then so, there's so much documentation that no one right, can deal so with that. That's what I was like, it's such an interesting... It becomes in itself normal. <laughs> Can we run down the rabbit hole of real versus imagined for a second? Here we go. The simulacra yes. versus simulation sort of conversation. With this Can time. you define those terms, up? <laughs> Not really. It sounds like it's yeah, cool. cool. I can see it's cool. for you. Simulacrum is simulation. I mean, it's the same, it's the same basically. Same but, thing. And it right. also is the idea of a copy of something with no original. Yeah, like right. the easiest example is Main Street USA, Disney World. But it just like, means you lose yeah, the yeah, sense yeah. of what it was the authentic original. Right. So, so, a so copy of a copy of a copy of a yeah, copy. Yeah, it becomes at the point where it, it just takes the original meaning away from things. The no creative so, future. So let's go on this idea that we today prefer the simulation of the <coughs> virtual representation of it rather than the real thing. And that is becoming more and more apparent. Human relationships, closeness, there's becoming less and less of that. So I think there's these like overhauls of like efforts to like rekindle our humanness. Mm. Hey, let's yes. talk and through run the together and you know. Through, through the museum, through institutions, uh, the museum is hub, the new museums program that all they do is create community forums. What are we doing right now? Huh. Yeah, well, let's review. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, art kind of had to step in for sis what, like, social or society or religion was doing, right? Like, the, the sense of a gathering. But also, like, the idea of something that's bigger than the sum of its parts is something that art kind of took on, in a way, and, and more explicitly, like, in a um, community way than had been happening, because it wasn't happening. Like, we don't really... Do you, do, I, do you identify that with a particular time period in which that happened or didn't happen, or... It's just a, it's just a, that's for
for PhD research. Really. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a question for your project. Do any artists go in and have a complete mental breakdown because there's too much choice and they don't know how to deal with it? Sure. I would anticipate yeah. sure. that that could be overwhelming <laughs> for some people and other people like, yeah, I got this. And other people I testify. I testify. I I've been there many times. But the very first time I came, the most amazing part is that you get a piece of paper that has a set of instructions, and the very first one says, don't touch anything for the four first days. This is an overwhelming place. Take your time. Adapt. You can curate your desk. So all of a sudden, you're like, oh, am I curating here? Okay. Which introduces another way of already touching or picking or moving. So you can bring things to your desk, and they will they will get privatized because they're in your desk. But then you're you're just easy to. And it's true because there's so many. What can you possibly do when you have everything? But there's no space because it's taken by everything. Mm -hmm. So. Right, but I mean, a lot, of, a lot of your artistic practice and your personality <laughs> jumps in because some people are like, okay, I got a plan. And then but it's all about, about so then when I was talking yeah. about the shared space, it's like all about collaboration because the reason why most you cannot touch anything is because you're most likely going to engage in conversation about why that chair is there because most likely there's a reason why all those red toys are in the same shelf. So then it's just like layers of collaboration. You're collaborating with people you don't even know or you have to make sure you leave your door open for many more that will come after you. So it's, you know, it's like more about transformation than distraction, right? But that's on the creative end, not the curatorial end, no? Well, the curatorial is there. That's the point. Right. The point. But for a museum of the future. <laughs> oh, no, I'm taking that answer. Well, I think the, another poignant thing that I think you touched on earlier was that this whole, whole story is about, the, one of the poignant aspects of the story is that it's, it's an allegory for alienation. I mean, it's, it's, it's about, you know, there was one part in the story where, where they were talking about it, this museum becomes the repository for these failed invasions by one planet over another, which is kind of like speaking of colonization, right. colonization. So, so it's kind of like you have these, these will of this one planet trying to like force its will on another planet, which is kind of like Spanish conquistadors trying to like pass their will off on, you know, South America or whatever. So, so it's, it's kind of like an allegory from that, because it shows you basically through such vast distances that it talks about the distance between planets and time travel and all that. And it, 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 all these things become failed, failed things, you know, failed uh, missions, but, and they end up being failed objects in a museum because it's, it's really so, so that's so, it's, so, so it speaks really to point. alienation, you and it, so it becomes the allegory for contemporary society in the sense that we we often people try to colonize the body, you know, you know countries or whatever, through political means or whatever. So, so yeah. that's yeah. <laughs> No, you touched on a point yeah, that, like, the, the pinnacle of an artist to get into a museum and like, and then it gets racked in a shelf and it's never thought about it. And it's like, yeah. Man, and like, then what? And then like, what if that's your dream? You get there and it's like all oh, smoke and mirrors, then what? It is smoke and mirrors. Well, what, it's a, about an idea of ambition and once you realize that ambition, you're like, well, what does this really mean anyway? And it's about... Um, Forwarding some kind of larger. I mean, it's not about the individual. It's about this collect, like this age, and being rec like recognizing an age. But I don't, I don't know. I'm just putting that. It's organized ordering the museum. I mm -hmm. think it's interesting what you're doing up there, like the psychological phenomenon that happens to somebody that's ordering. And going back to alienation, those people get alienated. Those people get judged in our culture. People who are marginalized. People who are not institutionally accepted or right. ignored or there, historically outsider. ignored outsiders. Yeah. Even in a culture now today where all our outsiders seem to be recognized, yes or no, I mean. I feel like the Whitney does that. This <laughs> we found in a basement and it's crazy. Well, sure. <laughs> there are institutions that recognize and exhibit outsider art. Um, certainly contemporary art is, you know, um, but wildly permissive. Pardon? It's just, I find it kind of bizarre, this notion of outside, mm -hmm. right? Like, even that's this way of 
taking in, in a certain way. When I think yeah. when I think about this, and it's why it's so relevant, it's really like maybe the museum of the future doesn't really distinguish between art and anthropology. Like yes, that's what uh, I found. Post-human. Yeah. Post-human. Yeah. Yeah. I think the main limit is the boundaries of our own planet. Our no. Dead yeah. <laughs> and they're traveling back here. It's like, why not? It's like, here we have an entire planet and an entire civilization coming over. But your point about there is no differentiation between anthropology and art and, art. and creativity or artworks. Art objects. Art objects. We are not looking at this at this art object and we're not looking at the, the society around it. We're just evaluating it on its own terms. Is that possible? I mean, what are, those, what are those terms? Who made them up? Do they have to do with place, time? I was just rereading um, this awful book that I received in my undergrad called Art and Primitive Societies, oh. and I think it was written in like 1960-something, and, and the first thing it starts is, let's, di let's discuss what a primitive society means, and I'm like, this is the worst, so a this is the worst book ever written, and, and to us reading it now, it just it seems ridiculous, and like, believe it or not, art was integrated into these societies. So we're, we can't really call it an art object. So, I mean, this is like a very old book. Uh, it's interesting how much you get to learn about Western cultures that yes. made those projections on those other, you know, it's much more about Western yeah. anthropology than it is about. Yeah, but it had this, this horrific introduction that talked about why, why we can't really call their objects art because they were integrated. Well, it's funny because it is totally post-human. It, it looks at all of this not as even classifiable, but as just detritus. It's just remnants of everything, you know, and it, they start maybe with location, you know, so it is kind of post an era where we can even identify such small, like, subcategories <laughs> for it. I would like, I don't want to like sparse conversation, but I'd like to take the opportunity to turn the show on. And yes, like, I would love it. I think this would be great. And 